Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see you all here, and thank you very much for coming. I'm Elena Kalinowska, Director of Public Programs and Education at the Hirschhorn. And again, I'd like to thank you so much for being here today. We are thrilled to have Klaus Oldenburg at the Hirschhorn as the speaker of our 2014 James T. Dimitian Lecture. Since its inauguration, we have had pleasure of presenting distinguished artists, curators, and critics who have come to this place to engage directly with our audience. It is a special pleasure that one of the most innovative and influential artists of the 20th century, Klaus Oldenburg, is here today with us. Klaus Oldenburg is continuously at work teaching the rest of us how the simplest objects can make a monumental and lasting impact, and that this will be the fascinating topic of his Demetian lecture. The lecture series was established in 2001 by the friends of Jim and Barbara Demetian to celebrate Jim Demetian's 17-year tenure at the Hirschhorn as the second director. Jim acquired many of the museum's most appreciated works including several pioneering pieces by Klaus Oldenburg. Two of them are on view in the exciting show at the Hub of Things, the new views of the collection. One is a soft bathtub model, ghost version from 1966, and the other one is Seven Up from 1961. We are delighted to have Jim Dimitian and his wife Barbara with us today. Before we begin, a few acknowledgements. I'd like to thank Melissa Chu, director of the Hirschhorn, for her support of our public programs. Thank you also to Hirschhorn staff, Kevin Hull, Alex Bendixson, Rachel Schmidt, Kathy Carver, and Nick Kaplan for their organizational help with this important program. And now to Klaus Oldenburg, one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. Klaus Oldenburg has left his unmistakable and often whimsical mark on most of the media of contemporary art and in a very, in any dimension, from minute to the monumental. Oldenburg was born in 1929 in Stockholm, Sweden, a son of a diplomat, which meant that the family traveled, including coming to the United States. He grew up in Chicago, and city life became one of the first themes of his work. From the beginning, Oldenburg transformed commonplace signs and objects into things that are different or better. In 1959, his first one-man show of three-dimensional work was held in the Jackson Gallery in the basement of Jackson Church on Thompson Street in New York City. The show was an installation based on the streets, clothes, food, and traffic signs in Greenwich Village. Not surprisingly, Oldenburg and his first wife, Patti Mucha, soon became involved in the improvisational performance, Art Happenings, also staging an important performance, Stars, here in Washington, D.C. in 1963. His soft sculptures, performance pieces, and installation began to attract attention, and he seized the day by renting an actual storefront in December of 1961 in order to display his plaster confections of cakes and ice creams. As soon as he had the chance, Oldenburg, assisted by his late wife and partner, Kossier van Bruggen, decided to take on architectural scale public sculptures focusing on household objects like electric stock sockers and lipstick to erect a modern version of obelisk. After encountering Oldenburg and Van Brugge, split button in Philadelphia, Jorge Luis Borges wrote that the artists saw something at a glance that no one has ever seen before the beginning of history. 
Germana Saland has said of Oldenburg's exploration of objects, sinking into everyday life thus became an ever new adventure. Oldenburg's works are represented in every notable museum around the world and more than 40 monumental collaborations with Kosje van Bruggen animate the streets of Berlin, Chicago, Dallas, Frankfurt, Castle, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Miami, Milan, Minneapolis, Paris, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Seoul, Tokyo, and Venice, among many other. So let us now welcome Klaus Oldenburg. So, well, that was a long story, and uh, you're only going to see a section of it because uh, this work is work that was begun in, uh, in the very late 60s and then uh, went on after that. The uh, uh, earlier references, uh, uh, the 60s was a big period, uh, but uh, they were put aside, and um, at, the end of, at the end of the 60s, I started to, uh, to think about uh, making uh, uh, large versions of uh, what I had been sketching and uh, this is one of them, which actually is in your collection here. Uh, this, you could see, is a typewriter eraser. And uh, you have to be told, I'm sure, that it's, it's lying on an island in the San Francisco Bay. And uh, those are little boats around there. Now, to build this sort of thing, of course, would be rather difficult. However, I continue to do that, to suggest that. This is in Dusseldorf, and it's across the Rhine, and you just get on that uh, saw and you drive across. <laughs> Nothing to it. And this one is a, um, see it's got an obelisk too, on the left there. This is actually a, a building that serves as a, uh, a burial device. And as people are buried, the screw goes down. Uh, <laughs> until it's at the bottom, and then they, there will be another one down the street. Uh, and you can think about the future of that, but <laughs> that, this was designed for uh, Park Avenue. Uh, when there was a building, there still is a building there, but it was then called the Pan Am building. But uh, it's, it sort of blocks Park Avenue, a rather strange uh, way to build it. Uh, and so I, thought uh, I'd do a variation on that and turn it into an ice cream bar, and which is uh, practical, you see, because there's a bite taken out of it. Whenever the ice cream bar is represented, there's a bite gone. And this way, the cars can get through the bite, so it doesn't block the street. This is a plan for uh, Central Park in New York, where all the foliage uh, would be removed. There would just be one big uh, plaza, and uh, these balls would be the size of houses, and they would all be buildings uh, that you could live in or work in, and uh, they would move slowly so that they were never in the same place. <laughs> when you woke up in the morning, you'd be on the other side of the park. <laughs> and it would also be interesting for the people living around the park to watch the pool balls. A, is that a fly? No, what is that? Anyway, this was a proposal for uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> the, the plan here was to, uh, to redo the, uh, the obelisk and turn it into a pair of scissors. And the hands, uh, the uh, handles would be uh, underground. What you see there is brown, that's, that's under, underground. So you'd see that upper part and it would start in the morning being together, as it is here, and it would gradually separate like a clock, and then it would reach the bottom at nightfall, and then it would start back up again. And it sort of symbolized to me what happens in Washington. You do a lot of work all day long, and then you go right back where you started from. <laughs> Maybe that's not true anymore. Anyway, those, those were obviously impossible to do. To do, they were uh, 
rather intellectual and, and they could never be, uh, be made on that scale. So, however, I wanted, to, I wanted to get into a larger scale and I also had uh, come in contact with a place that makes things out of steel, a uh, Lippincott company. So this was the first large work uh, made in steel and it's the uh, uh, lipstick uh, monument for Yale University. The original idea was that this would come crawling in on those tracks, which are like caterpillar tracks, and take a position like this. And the lipstick would be down uh, to the platform, and then someone could come by and having something to say, would step up on the platform and pump it up. There would be a pump there. And as he pumped, that gold and red would rise until it was all the way up, and then he could start speaking. But then, as he spoke and got involved, the thing started going down again, so that he had to go back to doing this and so on. That was the idea. It, it, was never, it never happened because we couldn't raise the money to do it, but that was the concept. This was uh, put up in a very uh, hectic time with the Vietnam War, and, and there was a lot of people wanting to make speeches, and uh, it stood there for a while, and then people started to uh, uh, disfigure it and take home pieces of it, and, and uh, it was restored. And if you, if you want to see it now, you have to go to Morse College, one of the colleges up at Yale. But it still exists, and uh, that was the first uh, large work. This was the second large work, and uh, uh, it's, you know, uh, everybody doesn't know what an ice bag is, but uh, it's, it's an old device that you used to put on your head too, you know, if you had too much to drink or something, a headache. And this was made for the Osaka World's Fair. And uh, it uh, actually is a sort of living object because uh, it moves. Uh, it actually, it was here once in Washington in the uh, National Gallery. But it, it moves around and twists and turns. And of course, you're not supposed to sit on it, you know, just sort of leave it free. And uh, that piece was purchased by the uh, Pompidou in Paris, but they don't seem to know what happened to it. So <laughs> However, we know what happened to this one. This is the original, and that's the one that's standing outside uh, in the garden. It's uh, on the, uh, let's see, what was that, the northwest corner, I guess. And uh, this is uh, called the geometric mouse. Uh, it's a variation on uh, uh, mouse toys, of course, uh, but the idea was to create a, a mouse toy that was not sweet and, uh, and beautiful. It was to be basically a geometric mouse, and it was all about, uh, it was an intellectual mouse, let's say. You could see the circles and the square, and it has two little tears that lie on the floor and uh, they're chained up to the windows. The windows roll in and out like that. And uh, you could go and look at it. It's, it's just, as I say, around the corner. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, I, was, uh, I had met and was working with uh, Kosha van Bruggen in uh, Holland. And this was the first piece that we put up together. And it was also the first of a series of, of large-scale projects. Uh, we're sitting here in the garden of the uh, Otterlo Museum, and uh, they're about to put the piece up. This is what the piece looks like. It was called the trowel, and uh, Kosha had uh, seen it earlier, and it was a silver color in a different spot, and she didn't like the silver color, and she didn't like the spot. So she changed the color, and she moved the place, moved it to this place. So she right away started having a lot to do with these works, as you'll see. This is a clothespin, or, or once was a clothespin. It's been, it's been redrawn and in a, uh, in a slightly, well, not slightly, but somewhat different manner. So it has a lot of grace, and uh, it is now designed to be a monument. And on the bottom left there, you see the Brancusi of the lovers kissing. And that is sort of a, uh, the same sort of thing that's going on here uh, in the center. Uh, these uh, two parts are held together with a spring that, uh, since this was done at the time of the, the celebration of, of the bicentennial, people interpreted those as sevens and sixes. 
So this was the beginning of the feeling that if you put up a monument, people began to interpret it and, and make an emblem out of it. And that became very much a part of, of all the works. And the factory Lippincott is, uh, is, was still working with me. And here you see them making the, uh, uh, the big one. And uh, this was really something. I mean, things started to get huge. There it was placed in its spot. Philadelphia is a wonderful city because they have this, uh, uh, when they build a new building, they have to set aside some money for art. And that's not true of many cities, but uh, that's why Philadelphia gets more monuments than other people. And uh, I have four of them in Philadelphia. The second piece uh, of that scale was this piece, which here is taking its trip from uh, uh, Connecticut, where it was made, to Chicago. And uh, you will see what it is. It's uh, being placed there, uh, and it's a uh, baseball bat, but it's called a bat column. Yeah, there's, there's what used to be known as the Sears Tower, which was then the tallest building in America. And, uh, and there you see the finished version. It, um, when it was first placed there, this was a kind of a rundown area of the city, and it was known as Skid Row, and uh, they uh, managed to clean that up and change it, and they altered all the buildings around it so that the, the, this, this bat column seemed to fit in perfectly, uh, whereas in the beginning it had stood in, a, in, a, in a rather among the ruins. But uh, this, uh, this is still up there, and uh, there's Kosher looking at it with the Sears Tower. And this followed a few, uh, a few years later, and uh, this is uh, Des Moines. And uh, in the lower right there, you'll see a sculpture which is known as Crusoe's Umbrella. And uh, it's a little obscure how we got to that point, but uh, we felt that we were standing on a, on a beach at this point, which was odd to be in Des Moines and stand on a beach. Uh, and then we also uh, we, uh, related the, the, the top of the umbrella to uh, the uh, uh, dome of the city uh, hall. Up, you could see up at the end there, at the top of the, of the road. And so it... Uh, in our minds, it turned into this. There was also a, a, a large umbrella insurance company nearby, uh, which blinked at night. And so this piece, uh, which is still there, and uh, I think uh, it's still appreciated, uh, was uh, at the point when Kosh and I decided that we were going to do just works that would be commissioned directly. We wouldn't go to a gallery and we wouldn't go to a museum. We wanted to be independent of galleries and museums. And so we did a show at the uh, Leo Castelli Gallery to prove how difficult it would be to show our present work. <laughs> and from there on, we didn't uh, show in any galleries. Now this, uh, another piece on the way, uh, this one is coming even further. This is uh, uh, about, uh, uh, well, this is some, somewhere, as you can see, in the desert, uh, and uh, about to land in Las Vegas. You can't quite tell what it is, but I can tell you what it is. It's a flashlight. And here it is being uh, raised in Las Vegas. And there it is standing between uh, a concert hall and a, a theater at the University of Las Vegas. The uh, first concept was to have uh, the, the flashlight turn up so that the light would go up in the sky. And that was because when you fly over Las Vegas, you see nothing but light going up. Up, up. So that was to join that. And then Koshi said, well, I think that's kind of silly. Why don't you just do the opposite and uh, turn it upside down? And then you'll be different. You know, there's nobody in, <laughs> in Las Vegas who has uh, the light like that. So 
uh, we rebuilt it and we did that and we made it as, as dark as possible by making grooves in the side so that this is a night scene but the day scene, the thing is totally black and it looks like a hole in the, in the sky. It's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite a different effect. And uh, that made me very happy and kosher too. This is Philadelphia and it's on the uh, university campus. We uh, were asked to do a piece there and uh, uh, we uh, thought about what to do and I don't know how it happened but Kosha at some point said, I want to do a button. I want to do a broken button. I want to do the, the, the least possible valuable thing in the world. And what would that be? That would be a broken button, say, you find on the sidewalk. So let's try that and see where we can get with that. So we went ahead and made a broken button. And it turned out to be rather beautiful. And uh, at least from my point of view, and, uh, it, it has, as you see, four holes in it. And those holes reflected the, uh, the original design for Philadelphia. Uh, and it, you can still see it on the maps. It's, it was divided that way. And uh, it served also as a, uh, a place for uh, the band and other times the football team. And uh, it was used for many things, but it was re repainted and properly cared for and is still there and still standing up. This is uh, on the banks of the Fulda River in Kassel. And uh, it's uh, during the Documenta uh, uh, 7, I think it was. It was early 80s. And uh, it's what uh, we call a Spitzhacke, or a, it, and uh, it's standing in a position that's determined by this, which is a castle <clears throat> up on the hill behind uh, the uh, Spitzhacke. And on the top of this castle is a wonderful monument of Hercules carrying an enormous club, holding an enormous club. So because this thing is so in line with the spot where we wanted to put the sculpture, it, it reaches straight down to where the sculpture is. We decided to make a sort of uh, a story about it that he had, instead of, we, we thought instead of the uh, pickaxe, instead of the, the, uh, uh, the other weapons he has, uh, we, he would toss the, the spitzhacke and it would fall directly in this point. So it sort of ties in with that uh, uh, place up on the hill. This, uh, was a sculpture that was made for uh, the uh, museum in Dallas, Texas uh, it, uh, when it opened. And uh, the idea was to use this space, which was rather large and very high, for about five or six artists only and permanently. And this was the beginning of it. You could see a soloit there in the back. And, and this is uh, our piece. And our piece also goes downstairs. So if you work there, you can also see it. But it, it stayed up for a while, but in the end, the, uh, the director couldn't uh, handle the fact that he, he couldn't compose in there or have parties and so on. So the, the original idea uh, uh, foundered and uh, this piece was taken down. I don't know where they have it now, but uh, I have been uh, trying to get it put back up. Here we are in Minneapolis. There's a garden there. You probably have, most of you have been there with the wonderful sculptures and it extends in back of the museum. And <clears throat> this was supposed to have, there, there's, a, court, there's a, a, a walk that goes all the way through the park and this comes, the walk comes to a climax at this point. And we were asked to do a sculpture there. Uh, and so we did this pond and uh, the spoon and uh, it's called the Spoon Bridge with Cherry. And here again, uh, Kosha was a great help because I had been playing with spoons for a long time, trying to make them into something. I had uh, bridges and I had a substitute for Navy Pier in the form of a spoon and all kinds of things, but it didn't work. And she said, well, that's because you don't have anything in the spoon. And so she went to a corner of the studio, there was a wooden, piece, a wooden cherry with a, 
with a stalk in it, and she said, why don't you put this in there? So we put that in there, and this was the result. And then we added a fountain that sprays out of the top of the stalk, and also water comes out of the top of the uh, cherry, and it creates a kind of liquid, uh, beautiful red effect, and then the water drops down into the spoon and then leaks out again into the, into the lake. And uh, they are about to restore this park, and I, they have to move this thing. It's going to be out of action for two years, but it's a permanent, permanent piece. And there we are before they unwrap the spoon. And the uh, water's not been put into the uh, pond yet. The idea was we, we thought that it would be nice to have uh, skaters in the pond, but that didn't work out. However, the piece looks very good in the winter, even without skaters. And at the winter, they take away most of the pieces, but they leave this one, and they, sort of the effect of ice cream on it, I guess. <laughs> this is in Paris, La Villette, which uh, lies somewhat on the outskirts of Paris, and they uh, rebuilt uh, the area as a park, and uh, we were commissioned to put a sculpture there. So, uh, after considering it, many things, we came to the conclusion that uh, we would uh, suggest a buried bicycle. Certain parts of the bicycle stick up, and you're supposed to imagine the rest of it. You could see the wheel there, the pedal, and the seat, and the bell in the back. And the seat is there. The pedal. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a piece that's very much admired by, uh, as a playground, and uh, most, most of the time uh, people are climbing up and down these things. And uh, so it, uh, it, in the daytime it's, it's uh, like a playground, and it's uh, only a sculpture at night. This is in uh, Cleveland, in the center of Cleveland. There's a, uh, a statue you see on the right, <coughs> which is a Civil War monument, and on the top it has a, has a woman uh, with uh, the name Liberty wrapped around her. And facing it is a, was a new building, this was uh, in the early 90s, a new building that was going to be constructed for the Standard Oil Company. And uh, we were asked to do a sculpture for the front of it, and we suggested uh, this uh, stamp, and we called it a free stamp because uh, we, we said, what should we put under the stamp, and what, le uh, what uh, word should we use, and uh, uh, Kosha said, how about free? And free seemed like the right thing, so it's known as the free stamp. And it uh, looked like that. You could see the lettering underneath there, if you could read F-R-E-E. But uh, then uh, uh, something happened, the, uh, the company was taken over and uh, the, uh, the, the person, who, the, the company that took it over decided that they didn't want to have this sculpture in front of the building. So there was a long back and forth and then um, several years. And then finally it was decided, Koshi said, again, she came to the rescue, she said, why don't we pick it up and throw it. <laughs> because we were working with a concept of site specificness and we had you know, resisted any uh, attempts to change the original idea, but by throwing it, you would have two site specifics and this would be just as specific as the other one. So this landed, uh, we made it land, we made it land next to the city hall and uh, that became the spot that uh, we then went to work on, and then people finally came around and, and accepted it. That's what it looks like. It was just cleaned, and uh, people like to climb on it, but uh, that's true of all the sculptures. Anyway, it's in very good shape. Uh, this was done for the, uh, Olymp the Olympics in uh, Barcelona, and uh, it's up on the hills of Barcelona, and uh, it's sort of out-of-date thing. I don't think people... Even then, we're using match covers, but they seem like a great subject, especially because of the colors, which seem to be Spanish, and also there seem to be a kind of movement that uh, 
I couldn't quite describe it, but it sort of reminded me of the fact that there had been a lot of war in the area, and they were, uh, there were pieces lying on the ground that looked as if they had perhaps been torn off or flown off or exploded or whatever. And uh, so they were, this one looks like it's sleeping, but uh, there were several like that. Then you could look down to the Mediterranean uh, from going through those, those uh, trees there. That piece is, is still up. And if you go to Kansas City, you will know where this is. Uh, the uh, Kansas City Museum is very formidable and uh, stands out very strongly with its columns and so on. Uh, I mean, here in town they have so many of these, but in Kansas City they have only one of these. And it's, it, it, it stands in front of this open space, which is kind of, was kind of, always was kind of frightening. There was nothing on this open space, and you just looked back and you saw this, this monumental building. So, Kosh and I were asked to do something for it, and uh, at, at some point uh, uh, she fell asleep in... Uh, inside, I think it was in front of a Frederick Remington a painting, and she woke up and she saw all these Indians with feathers. And she thought, perhaps we could have something where maybe some birds fly over and they drop feathers uh, into the field. And that developed into this concept of the shuttlecock. Uh, there's uh, uh, four of them in different positions. And uh, She's looking the other way. There's a Henry Moore. The, the idea was to treat the, uh, the museum as a, a net, uh, as a tennis net, because uh, it was standing across this green field as if it were a, a tennis field. And uh, so you have some of them on this side and some of them on the other side. Now, this is in, in 94. Uh, we... Uh, uh, we began to change our approach because the factory that we had made all the steel pieces in was going out of business. And so also there were changes in fabrication. We found a factory out in San Francisco that uh, dealt uh, with fiberglass. And fiberglass made it possible for us to think up sculptures that were soft in color or uh, soft in, in shape and uh, also that they uh, are could be turned into all kinds of different positions. This was the first thing we did uh, using uh, uh, fiberglass. This is in Frankfurt. The, it's called the inverted tie. And I guess people come out of the offices there, the first thing they do is to grab their tie and pull it off their neck. And anyway, that one is, is, uh, is still there. And this just shows us standing in, inside it when you could see how the thing was made. It's not metal, it's just really, it's very hard and very durable stuff, but it's all, it's all fiberglass. Uh, the fellow on the left is uh, Serge, who uh, came in at that point and was a great help in making these sculptures. This is the beginning of a saw. This was also done in the same uh, materials. And this saw has a destiny for Tokyo. Uh, outside of Tokyo, and uh, it stands in front of a most amazing building, which is a, a convention center, where everything is triangle. And uh, we looked at that, and we thought we have to do something on a triangular theme. And also, it's such a, a combination of different things that, that uh, you want to saw through it. And so we got the idea of, of a saw. And then, of course, it, we found out that uh, in Japan, the saws don't look like this, which made it even better because it became completely exotic. You know? <laughs> and people arriving here, Japanese uh, uh, inhabitants uh, arrive here, and they say, what in the world is that? And so it's, it's a saw. And... Uh, uh, I haven't been there for quite a while, but it was, it's, it's a wild site, and they've now also planted uh, uh, flowers and trees around it, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting installation. This is up in Nebraska, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, I carry a, uh, a notebook all the time, 
which looks sort of like this. It's small. And then when I'm finished with it, I tear it in half and throw it away. Well, what we did here is that uh, Koshe wrote some things and I wrote some things. And uh, you could see that they've been uh, lasered out, cut out of the, of the pages. And uh, uh, they are created in such a way that if you're looking at them from one side, you're looking at, say, Koshe's writing, your mind is upside down. And if you go on the other side, then hers is upside down. And uh, so there's a variation. And I, mine deal with objects, and hers is are more poetic statements. It's right next to the uh, university, and uh, there's a, a sculpture garden there with a with number of pieces. You can see the writing there. So I think the up at the top ones are cautious, and then bind are backwards. Uh, this is Milan, the center of Milan near the uh, railroad station that uh, carries uh, trains north. And it's a, uh, a needle with thread. Ago filo e nodo. And this is also made of uh, fiberglass, except for the, uh, the needle. And the concept here is of a thread with a knot in, in one end being placed into the ground and then coming up a little further on for the next uh, bit of sewing. And it also uh, refers, of course, to uh, the, uh, uh, the sewing in the, uh, the fashion industry in Milan and to also to the, uh, the format of the emblem uh, of Milan, which is a, a, a sword uh, wrapped around with uh, a snake. This is the one in the fountain. We didn't put it in the center of the fountain, we just put it on the side so it would be a sort of a chance effect. This is Cologne. Cologne is uh, a place where people are always buying things. It's just the streets are full of people buying things. So uh, we wanted to get a little bit above that. And so there we are up on top. Of course, <laughs> we're on a department store, so it probably is also involved with buying things. And uh, the, the, the city of, of Cologne is, is full of uh, churches. And you see them when you look out over, over Cologne, you see the churches everywhere. So ours is references a church, uh, particularly that large one that's on the left side. Uh, and... Uh, also, there's ice cream cones outside of all of the, uh, uh, the stores. So the combination um, uh, immediately suggested this result. This, this was built in, uh, in uh, San Francisco too and um, shipped to Cologne. This is also San Francisco. And what you're looking at now is a... Um, is, a, is an arrow being fired into the ground. Uh, it's on the bay, which you can see behind there. And uh, San Francisco is always talked about as the, as the place of love. There's a song about it. And uh, I know the mayor at the time was pushing love. And uh, everybody was talking about how San Francisco was love. So we thought we'd make this sculpture and place it next, this is the Oakland Bay Bridge, and uh, uh, related to the bridge. Then we went to, uh, to Denver. In Denver, they were <clears throat> building a new museum. Uh, they wanted to have a sculpture outside of it. And uh, we were, Coach and I were uh, looking around, as we always did, we would go to a place and, and look at everything and try to think of what would fit in. And uh, we were sitting in a restaurant, and uh, it was a week where uh, called Sweep Week or something like that, where everybody went out and swept the streets. And so we saw a lot of people sweeping the streets, and it seemed, seemed unusual. And then we, we figured out a... Um, uh, a, a, a uh, uh, well, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's, it's a representation of, of, of what Denver is about. Denver is a place that the flatland suddenly turns very high and the mountains come very quickly. And uh, what happens there is that the wind blows uh, in 
uh, from, the, from the prairies and it hits the mountains and then it goes straight up. So we thought we'd, we'd translate that into this, at which the pan is the mountain and the uh, broom is the wind. And it's, you can see it's quite large as a person standing on the right there. And uh, that worked out pretty well. And that's still there. This is a piece in Korea, in Seoul, Korea. It's a, uh, a piece that uh, Kosha designed of all these pieces. She designed this one. And it has water coming out of it, which uh, flows, as you see, uh, down into... Uh, uh, eventually it goes into a river and becomes uh, a, a, street, two, a street with a river in the center. So it's uh, facing the other way. You could see the street, that the street sort of disappears and the water comes out from underneath. This is, in, again, this is the last one we have. This is uh, Philadelphia. And it's just between the uh, uh, art academy and the art school. There's a little uh, uh, alley there that runs between them. And uh, uh, I was asked to put a, a sculpture there. Uh, this is the result. I used a paintbrush because uh, the, the academy there is one of the few art schools that still uses paintbrushes. And so I thought that would be symbolic. And uh, I leaned it a bit. I leaned it out over Broad Street. You could see there's a little drop of paint in the front there, a little glob of paint. And uh, that's that wonderful museum is on the left side, and the school is on the right side. And at night, it's pretty nice. It's illuminated from inside up at the top, and uh, from outside uh, where the, where the uh, paint is. And that's the city hall behind. Sort of nice because uh, the city hall is also behind the clothespin, which is around the corner. So there's two of them that use the city hall. You've seen uh, the pieces that I wanted to show to you. And uh, I may not have made them very clear, but uh, I hope I did. So now we're going to answer questions. <laughs> I don't know who's in charge of selecting the questioner. Is that to be me? I see someone there. People have called you a pop artist. Do you like that term? Do you think you are one? How would you define that? Well, I don't know what a pop artist is exactly. Uh, I suppose uh, the, uh, uh, you know, every, every uh, generation gives, is given a name of some sort which uh, doesn't really describe them. But um, uh, I think uh, uh, what, what, uh, what I do is use the surroundings. I use my surroundings, and uh, these are often uh, surroundings that uh, can, can, have a, uh, a, 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 can be interpreted as, as uh, commercial material, pop material, for example, uh, uh, food or uh, uh, candy or whatever. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, my, my aim is to create form and uh, surprise and other kinds of things. That, uh, but, um, you know, pop, pop artists, I, I also feel that pop artists refers more to painters than to sculptors for some reason. But it doesn't matter. If you want to call me a pop artist, it's okay. <laughs> do you have a particular name for your form of art? Do you, do you consider yourself in any group? No, I consider it uh, mine. <laughs> um, if you were commissioned to do a piece for in front of the Capitol building in Washington, what do you think you would probably do? <laughs> well, you know, we, we did have... Uh, we did have one there that had a capital in the background, but it was quite far away, that the one in Des Moines. Uh, oh, I know, I know, that's what you mean. <laughs> but I tell you, I, uh, I, I don't know, the, uh, I'd have to visit it. I mean, that would be very lucky if you, one got that commission, but you can't just, uh, you know, think of something and go over there and present it. Uh, every time we, um, we did a piece, it would take uh, several months, we had many visits to a place and see what, what we would do. And uh, I think it would be uh, 
Well, it's always uh, great to do something in a, in a in a in an important space, you know. So I certainly would would accept that, but I, I can't tell you what I would make. It was something that, uh, well, you, you can imagine, that's quite a project, yeah. Do you make models before you make the final product? And if so, how big do you make the models? The models, well, <coughs> the, uh, the model, the whole, works, the whole work begins with a, with a drawing. And a drawing is a, a small scale thing. And you have to imagine it as being very large, the way those drawings were in the beginning of the, of the, the show. Uh, and then you build a, a relatively, uh, well, it's small, but it's, it's a model that has, has uh, details on it that you want to realize. And then you, uh, we, had a, we had a system. We would, we would get to this point where the model was about this big, that we would take it to the person who had commissioned it and we would say, do you like this? And it wasn't finished, but it had enough on it to say what it might be. And that person could then say yes or no. And if the person said no, we simply took it home and that was the end of it. And uh, if they said yes, and of course they had already paid some money to get to that, that point. If they said yes, we'd continue and then we'd make a larger model until we had a model that was big enough to, to uh, uh, enlarge into the final work. We never made, we, we always had models. We always had models. Oftentimes your artwork appears to be the antithesis of abstract expressionism, which came before the pop art movement. And I was just wondering, how do you feel about non-representational and abstract art? Do you still like it? How do I feel about what? Non-representational and abstract non -re art. Non-representational art. Well, I, I don't think it's possible to make non-representational art. Uh, even abstract uh, uh, expressionist so-called art was, was rather representational in many ways. Uh, but there are people making uh, uh, works that have nothing in them at all. They just simply draw a line on a, on a wall. Uh, there is a way, I mean, there's so many different ways to, to, to make art. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, I wouldn't really know how to how to do that. I uh, I would be uh, I'd want to have somebody climb in the in the space and you know do something or something. I I I guess I wouldn't uh, be good for that. Can you tell us about some of your favorite artists um, and how they may have impacted your thinking throughout the years? Oh well, I have lots of favorites. I I mean, why should one not have all artists as favorite artists? because they're all doing something different. I mean, the good ones are all doing something different, each one. And uh, sometimes you do get uh, sort of uh, fixed with one artist. I, I used to like Manet very much. And uh, I wanted to paint like Manet at some point. And I did a few paintings. I painted the uh, Olympia, for example. And, uh, but it didn't last though the painting still exists. Uh, it's in the Stockholm Museum. <laughs> I don't know if that's an answer, but... Yeah? I read that you were acquainted with Marcel Duchamp. Can you tell us anything about him and whether he was an influence on you? Well, uh, Marcel Duchamp was, was still around uh, when uh, I came to New York. And uh, you would see him frequently at parties, and he liked also to go to happenings. And um, uh, I can remember two times he went to happening. The first happening uh, was uh, one in which uh, the everybody everybody expired at the end of the happening, and so they <laughs> they collapsed on the audience. And uh, this uh, one person collapsed on top of Duchamp. And he was very surprised, and he didn't know what to do. <laughs> they finally moved and let him out. <laughs> and another case where Duchamp was coming to a, a performance uh, called Movie House uh, in, a, in a theater, small theater. And the aim, the aim of Movie House was to, to uh, not have the audience sit down, to have the audience stand up and have the actors sit down. So there were about six or seven actors sitting and eating hot dogs and stuff, and all the rest of the people were all standing around. 
And Duchamp raised his hand and he said, please, he said, I'm an old man. He said, I wonder if you would let me sit down. Would it spoil your peace? <laughs> so I said, no. And uh, so he was, uh, I wasn't uh, close to him, but he was on the scene all the time. And as far as uh, the found object is concerned, uh, there's a lot of controversy about that. Um, I have sometimes been... Uh, told that I use found objects, but I really don't. I, I mean, I always, as you see with the, the pieces here, uh, I always alter them in some way, which gives them uh, a formal character that, that is my idea. Before the drawing and the prototype, how many real products do you see? How many ice cream cones did you have before getting that ice cream you cone? You eat them or? Eat have... them, see, I don't know, you tell me. And actually, how do you choose ice cream cone instead of something else? What goes through your thinking process? Yeah, how many ice cream cones do you eat? One, does one eat in one's lifetime? It's a question. I, I, I certainly ate a lot of ice cream cones. But when it came to making one, I, I, uh, I, I drew it myself. I studied, I studied ice cream cones and I, I, I made my own version of it, which I did not eat. Uh, could you talk about the piece that's in the sculpture garden here? I, you might have addressed it, but the typewriter eraser, was it site-specific? Did you develop it for Washington? And I just might make an observation that some of my younger colleagues, when we go down there, I often show them the piece. I say, you know what this is, and they have no idea because they've never seen a typewriter yeah. eraser. Well, that is, that, that, that is true that I, I, uh, I tend to be drawn to things, to objects that are out of, out of date. And that may have something to do with the fact that I remember them from childhood or whatever, but it also gives them a kind of a, a freedom, gives me a kind of freedom to do things with them. And uh, also, as, as you point out, it raises mysteries. People don't know what it is. And uh, the typewriter eraser uh, was a wonderful thing. When I was a child, uh, I used to play with my uh, father's typewriter, and uh, I loved typewriter erasers. Uh, there is, I have a cartoon at home where this, uh, uh, the mother is taking the kid to the, to the museum. And there's, uh, this piece is there, the, uh, uh, the one you refer to, uh, the typewriter eraser. And uh, he says, the kid says, uh, what is that? And she said, that's a typewriter eraser. And he looks at her and he said, what's a typewriter? <laughs> so, so that one will never come back. It's, <laughs> But that gives you the freedom to do whatever you want with it. I've never dressed up as a typewriter yet, but that could happen. Yeah. Do you install um, your pieces with the intention that people will climb on them, or is this just like a result that happens, and how do you feel about people climbing on them and interacting with them? Well, that's a fact with all uh, works that you do outdoors especially climbable ones. Uh, people do that and they also skate up on them and uh, they do terrible things to them, but they draw on them and so on. So uh, uh, when you make a permanent piece uh, for outdoors, you have to be prepared to uh, clean it up every five years or so it, or sooner. And it's just part of it. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, you can't really discourage people from doing this unless you had somebody standing there all the time. It's, it's part of, it's like I said, uh, for the kids in, in Paris, they just, all, all day long they're playing on these, these sculptures and then they go home and, and the sculptures come into their own. But uh, the, uh, the, the people climbing on them and drawing on them are not part of the sculpture. Maybe if I did that, they'd keep away. I don't know. <laughs> How big was the what? The shirt. Oh. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it was ordinary size, just a, an ordinary shirt that had been put into a, uh, a, uh, it, into a cleaner. I, it was just a fantasy, really. 